Okay, we're on questions 12 through 23 now on the review sheet. So let's keep going. So when reading a measuring tool, you report all of the known digits plus one estimated position. So that's what we did on question 11. As you look at the tool, you find the smallest marking, estimate one position beyond. Okay, appropriate tool for measuring the following measurements. So measuring approximately 100 milliliters of water. So if it's approximate, we want about that much of water, a beaker is totally appropriate. But if I want to measure exactly 75 mils, if I want an exact measurement, then I need a graduated cylinder. Because the precision is going to be better in the graduated cylinder, I get better markings. All right, number of significant figures. Remember, that's the Atlantic Pacific rule. So if here is my United States, if this is the Pacific, this is the Atlantic, if the decimal's present, I start at the Pacific, go from left to right, start counting at the first non-zero digit and count everything that follows. If the decimal's absent, I start at the Atlantic, go right to left, count, start counting at the first non-zero digit, count everything that follows. So 14, it's present, so I go from left to right. I start at the one, so I count one, zero, and eight. I have three significant figures. 110 cars, that's a trick, because that's a count. And remember, counts are not measurements, they're counts, so that is an infinite number of significant figures. 480 oranges, that's a count. So that is an infinite number of significant figures. 0. 0.4260 grams, the decimal's present. I start counting at the four. So it's going to be four, two, six, zero, four significant figures. 100 centimeters, decimal's absent. I go this way, and I only count the one. So there's one significant figure. 3.7050, it's present. Start counting out the three, count everything that follows, five significant figures. Now when you're dealing with scientific notation, you can ignore that part there, you just look at that number. So the decimals present, I start counting at the five, four significant figures. 2.500, four significant figures. 100.10, five significant figures. All right, a pure substance and a mixture. Pure substance is going to be an element or a compound. And in an element and a compound, everything in that sample is identical. Okay, and this is where we did the activity with the stickers and the nuts and bolts and the washers and all that kind of thing. Now, in a compound, the elements are present in a fixed ratio. The uh, the formula is the same regardless of where you get the compound anywhere in the United States, anywhere in the world. Um, so H2O is always H2O, regardless of where you find the water. Um, a mixture is a physical blend of two substances. The percentages can vary. Um, and it's not a mixture of sand and water or salt and water is not going to be the same regardless wherever you go. The percentages can change. So a compound is a chemical combination of two or more elements. Element is the simplest form of matter. It is the building block. And then your mixture is going to be a physical blend. So element compound, heterogeneous or homogeneous mixture. So remember, heterogeneous, you're going to see all the different components. Homogeneous is going to be the same sort of everywhere throughout. Sodium chloride is a compound because it's sodium and chlorine bonded together. Salt and sand is a heterogeneous. Kool-Aid in water is a homogeneous. It's also called a solution. Oil in water, because it will separate into two layers, is homogeneous. <coughs> Excuse me. Gasoline, when you buy gasoline, it actually is a homogeneous mixture of different um, hydrocarbons. Oxygen is an element. You find it on the periodic table. Sugar is a compound. It's a um, reaction. You get a reaction between carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and they are chemically combined. And air is a homogeneous mixture. All right, physical chemical. 
Remember, a physical change and a physical property you can determine without changing the substance. So if you have to change the substance, then it's a chemical property. So density is physical because you can determine that without changing the substance. Boiling point, physical. You're not changing, you're not breaking down the, the compound, you're not changing it from one substance to another. Flammability is chemical because you have to burn it so you get something else at the end. Solubility is physical. You're dissolving, but you can get that substance back. It's actually a reversible process. Ability to tarnish. Tarnish is like rusting, so that's going to be chemical. And then your freezing point is going to be physical. Okay, because we can freeze it, and then um, we're not changing the substance. We're just changing the physical state. Okay, chemical change or physical change. So burning gasoline, that's going to be chemical. Freezing, all changes of state are physical. Baking a cake is chemical. Blowing up a balloon is physical. Dissolving is always physical. And formation of a precipitate, you're mixing two solutions together that are clear, and you get something that's going to be cloudy or a solid is formed, so that is chemical. And then we have signs of the chemical reaction. How do we know that a chemical reaction changes? Well, you're going to have a temperature change, sometimes accompanied by light, so that would be burning something. You're going to have a gas being formed. You're going to have a solid being formed. That is going to be formation of a precipitate. Sometimes there's an odor change. Um, solid gas odor, temperature, for, um, color change sometimes. Okay, but a color change by itself isn't necessarily an indication of a chemical change because things can co change color without being a chemical reaction, but those are the general ones you're looking for. All right, independent, dependent, constant control. So independent variables would I change. Dependent variable depends on the independent variable and we measure it at the end of the experiment. Constant is everything you keep the same, um, and then a control is what you compare everything against. So we have 10 grams of marble chips and react it with 100 mils of HCl. We collect carbon dioxide to determine the rate. The student runs the same experiment but uses 20 grams of marble chips and 100 mils of HCl. So what is it that we're changing? Well, we changed the amount of marble chips. So that is the independent variable. And we are measuring the amount of CO2 given off. So that's the dependent. Thing we're keeping the same, you notice the volume of the HCl, the 100 mils of the HCl was constant. We assume we're keeping the equipment the same. We're assuming we're keeping the concentration the same, keeping the type of marble the same. And this is going to be a chemical reaction because bubbles are given off. All right, calculating molar mass. So remember, you add up all the masses of the individual elements. So you need a periodic table for this. So your molar masses are going to be one magnesium, which is 24.31. I have two oxygens, which is 16. And I have two hydrogens, which is 1.01. So we have plus 2 times 16 plus 2 times 1.01. .01. And when you add those together, go 2 past the decimal on this, and we get 58.33, and the unit is grams per mole. All right, CO2, it's going to be 1 times the mass of carbon, which is 12.01, .01, plus 2 times the mass of oxygen, which is 16, so it's going to be 44.01 grams per mole, okay? And then H3PO4 is going to be 3 times 1.01, .01, that's the mass of hydrogen. It's going to be 1 times the mass of phosphorus, which I actually don't have in front of me, which is 30.97. And then 4 times the mass of oxygen, which is 16. And I don't have the answer to that in front of me, but you would just add those all together. Okay, 
Now doing mole conversions. So what I would recommend is set that and put that mole map on your um, sheet. Either to put the steps down or put the little steps that you need to take. So remember mole was in the center. We can go back and forth between particles, volume, and mass. So if I want to get to particles, I use Avogadro's number. If I want to get to volume, I use the 22.4, which is the molar volume. If I want to get to mass, I use molar mass, which is what we just practiced doing in question 21. So if I have 3.2 moles of sodium carbonate, mole is mentioned once, I need one conversion. So all what I need to do, oh, I do have H3PO4 in front of me. I lied, 96.99. Okay, so if I wanna go from moles to molecules, what I need to do is I need to do one conversion. Molecule is a particle, so I'm gonna to need to use Avogadro's number. And then I'm gonna use train tracks in order to figure out do I multiply or do, do I divide. So if I have 3.2 moles, put it over one, mole comes down. Oops, something funny is happening here. All right, I will rewrite it over here. So 3.2 moles. Put it over one, mole comes down, molecule goes to the top, one is always going next to mole, and then I have, whoop, where did it all go? 6.02 times 10 to the 23. 3.2 moles over one mole. So I'm multiplying by Avogadro's number, and I get 1.93 times 10 to the 24, and make sure you know how to hit this into your calculator, okay? Now 23, how many moles of ammonia are in 1.20 times 10 to the 25 molecules? Again, mole is mentioned, one conversion. Molecule is a particle, so we need to use Avogadro's number. So what we're gonna do is we start with number in unit, 1.20 times 10 to the 25 molecules. Put it over one, molecule comes down, mole goes to the top, put a one next to mole. Which means the only other place we have is to put it in the denominator, 6.02 times 10 to the 23. So now I take top and divide by bottom. If you get times 10 to the 46 or 10 to the 47, it means you don't know how to use your calculator. Okay, the answer is 19.93 moles. If you get any answer other than that, come see me for help with your calculator.